Yes, we get to go to lunch and it feels like you got a big break. You know what I'm saying? Because usually when I do the test first thing in the morning, or when, I, when I come out of the classroom, everybody's supposed to go to the shop, but they go out there and they take a break that lasts about 30 minutes before they start work. So this will then, and, uh, ain't that right, Tyler? All right. So now you guys have got multiple choice and true false. Is that right? Okay, let's do this. Let's do this quick. Most parking brakes, this is a brakes test six, and we're basically talking about park brakes. This is really uh, some rich material. Most parking brakes use a separate set of brakes that are applied independently of the service brakes. That's not really true, but it's getting truer than it ever used to be because a lot of the times your Crown Vickies and your Chevys have got the brakes in a little hat in the rear rotor. Mm -hmm. You know, the little the rear rotor's got a little brake, a miniature brake drum made on the center of it, and they got special uh, brake shoes in there that's yeah. just for parking brakes. That's awesome. that's like I've seen that a lot. A lot more. Now, this, this test here, if you go by the answer key, uh, is false, but that's not true anymore because most of them nowadays have got separate brakes. Uh, the, the one exception, though, is a 2005 uh, Ford 500 out there that Michelle Goosby Drive uses the same pads for park brakes, and it's got that silly piston you got to screw in, you know, whenever you're doing the rear brakes. And oh, it's a pain. We've done those brakes on that one. To avoid putting undue stress on the park brake cable, it's best to press and hold the service brake pedal and then apply the park brake. Sure. That's actually true, although nobody I know does that. Uh, ideally, you should use the parking brake as little as possible to be sure the mechanism operates correctly when you do need to use it. That's false. If you use it a lot, it's going to keep it free. If you almost never use it, you're subject to have locked up cables. Now, we did a brake job on a 94 Ranger one time that this guy, and I would swear that he must live on the other end of a creek, and he drives up that creek for you know, 150, 200, 300 yards every time before he goes home. I don't know that, but that thing looked like it had spent most of its life underwater as far as the brakes. Every spring on the rear brakes was rusted out, messed up. The park brake cables were rusted out. Everything on there was rusted. The wheel cylinders had to be replaced, and you couldn't get the lines loose. They were all rusted. Did this was a, a trip up north, maybe because of I don't know where it came from, but it, well, it was the forestry instructor's uh, ranger. It was a it was a mess. I mean, we had to replace the park brake cables on that thing and everything. It was a booger bear. Perhaps. All right, then. Uh, the rotor of an auxiliary parking brake is a, uh, on a caliper system is shaped uh, like a hat, and that's right. Okay, the small brake shoes of an auxiliary park brake tend to wear out easily, even with proper use, and that's false, but I will tell you what. It's amazing to me how many times on these late model Chevrolet pickups, kind of like that GMC we've got in the newer ones, uh, that you will take that rotor off of the rear brakes and find those rear parking brakes worn out. I mean, they're just worn out. They aren't hard to fix. I mean, they're very simple to do. They've got one shoe that's just like a most of a circle, and you've got to work it on the, around that thing and put it on. It ain't really hard to do. I mean, I ought to have you all, you know, do that just so you can get your hands on it. But uh, cause we've done them on these uh, college trucks. Let's see. Number six, only hand-activated parking brakes use a ratchet mechanism. That's false. A lot of times your pedal does, too. And seven, failure of a parking brake to release is often due to a corroded cable, and that's true. If you, you'll apply that thing, but the spring pressure that's trying to unapply it won't be able to overcome that. And we had that on that little escort. Somebody had operated the park brake, and it seized up the uh, cables going out there to it, and it, it wouldn't want to drive off. Uh, okay, number number eight. Incidentally, let me ask you this question, um, and I got a little input from Daniel uh, Kelly. What did you all think about uh, Adam's substitute teaching last week. Oh, it was good. Yeah. Good. yeah. yeah. But were you all the ones that he showed all this stuff to? Uh-huh. Was it pretty impressive that that knothead could draw this off the top of his head? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, he just drew this off the top of his head. He's, he's, he's constantly thinking about stuff like that. But anyway, he, he's a smart cookie. Well, you uh, notice that we learned how to do all that stuff on that side of the board? Yeah. We yeah. can make a lot of money. Just yeah, all that. that stuff. Yeah, that... Uh, this, that's good stuff over there. But anyway, he's got a lot of uh, he's got a lot of experience doing that with Toyota and all that. And he's had a lot of schooling and everything. Okay, um, he's been to schools that I haven't been to. I mean, with Toyota, he's a Toyota expert. Anyway, uh, let me see number eight. All of the following are components of a park brake mechanism, except what? B. Uh, number uh, C. Yeah, C. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> which system of the park brakes use the same brake shoes or pads as the service brakes? Who knows? What do you think? What about the integral parking brake? Integral means they're all part of the same deal. Got me? 
If a brake warning light stays on when the parking brake hand lever or pedal is not applied, you should do what? What should you do? They don't even have all the answers I would have put on here. One of them is verify the lever or pedal is returning fully to the release position. When you pull it up with your foot. Have you ever had one like that? Pull up with your foot. And then two, uh, or B, check the switch at the parking brake hand lever or pedal. What else would you do that's not on this list? Check the fluid. That's a good plan. Check the fluid because if it's low, and what else will make the red brake light come on? What if you've got a little bit of uh, imbalance between the uh, back and the front brakes, like there's one of them that's you know got some air in it? You're going to have that. That's going to cause that little proportioning valve to turn on that red light. That'll turn it on too, and that will also shut down the ABS, which will turn on the yellow ABS light. But you're going to have a yellow ABS light if it's newer than an 87 model, because on pickups and vans it was factory. I mean, it was federal law that they have that. Uh, now let me tell you something else. Since I'm talking about brakes. And I've said this before, you know when you're doing the vehicle inspections, the high mount, the center high mount stoplight, you know, the, the one in the center behind the glint windshield, you know what that's called, right? You know what, you know how you, uh, how you do that? That's C-H-M-S-L. When you see that, C-H-M-S-L, remember that's talking about that center high mount stoplight. Center high mount stoplight. Chrysler calls it that, so does General Motors. If you look on that green GMC truck y'all are looking on, one of the fuses is CHMSL. It's got a separate fuse. Now, one day, there was a guy doing an inspection on, a, on the Dodge Stratus we have. He was one of my students. He's a, you remember the guy that came in here the other day and borrowed the scan tool? Yeah. Yeah, the Ethan. Okay, he was doing this vehicle inspection on the Dodge Stratus that we got, the DS-106. And I said, did you check the high mount stoplight? Uh, yeah. And he looks in the back windshield, and that ain't where it was. It was in the trunk, on the top of the trunk. And when we mashed the brake, it didn't come on. And what I've said is, some people have heard me say this, you're 40% more likely to be rear-ended if that light's not working. Really? Absolutely. That's why the government federally mandated center high mount stoplights on cars in 1986, because they found out that if that light is there, you're more, I mean, people will see that light when they may not even notice the other one. That's crazy because you always notice the bus stop lights, but you're, I mean, but they found out that if you got one of those, you're 40% less likely to get rear-ended, and so they made them start putting that on there. I remember reading that whenever they first started putting center high mount stop lights on there. There was a reason for them to do that. Well, the long and the short of it is, if you neglect to check that center high mount stop light and somebody gets rear-ended, they could technically bring it back to you. If you just checked it and then they get rear-ended down the road a ways and the guy says, well, I didn't ever see a high mount stoplight come on, you know, <laughs> or you know what I'm saying? I mean, see how I could go back, you know? Would that be like the same, like, as the one I got in the spoiler? Yeah, that's a center high mount stoplight, yeah. If it's not working, you may get crashed into, just watch out. Yeah, you know, that light's on there for a reason. Uh, all right, now then, uh, we're going to say, let's see, um, the three basic, oh, incidentally, number 10 is C, that's both A and B. And the three basic types of mechanism used to mechanically actuate rear disc integral parking brakes include the following, uh, except, and they got A is a screw nut cone, B is a ball ramp, C is a recirculating ball, and D is a cam rod. Please. A recirculating ball is steering, a steering gear thing. It ain't got nothing to do with those brakes. Okay, uh, which actuating mechanism is common on general motors vehicles? And that's what we're talking about, park brakes now. Um, that is a screw nut cone. And I'll show you that one day if I don't forget about it. Which actuating mechanism is common on Ford vehicles? And, they, you know, the, the, the B is the ball ramp. I mean, not, most of the Ford vehicles don't have that. Crown Victorias ain't got it. You know, now them Ford 500s do. You know what I'm saying? But uh, the ball ramp stuff, uh, basically the ball ramp is it's got a little ramp, a ball that's right in a dimple. And whenever you pull a park brake, it rolls it up so that it's, you know, moving a little bit. You know, when that ball rolls up the ramp, it pinches. I mean, it's, you know, and those are the kind of, like I say, that you got to screw them back in when you're putting the pads on. Which actuating mechanism is common in forward vehicles, ball ramp? Uh, that is the, uh, the D, or I mean, I mean the, excuse me, the B. Park and brake controls typically include all the following components except D. what? Uh, yeah, a normalizer. Okay. What in the world is a normalizer? All right. Okay, question number 15. We're on the home stretch, y'all. Uh, to replace the primary front cable of a parking brake system, you should do all of the following except what? 
except what? Uh, a, you're going to loosen the adjuster at the equalizer until they're slack in the cable. All right. You're going to hold the cable with a wrench and then loosen the adjuster nut with another wrench. You're going to remove the cable from the equalizer and then from the hand lever pedal assembly. Mm -hmm. The one of the things that yeah, the one thing you're uh, not going to do is remove the cable from the backing plate. Now, do y'all know how to remove the cable from the backing plate? No, you got to do better than that. Everybody, Don't you're not going to well, you break it. Or no, huh? you have to pull the whole. Well, the backing plate. Let's say that you just going to pull that cable housing. You know how the cable housing snaps into the backing plate? It's got little fingers that they go through this hole and they spread out like an Indian arrowhead, and then they can't come out. All right. What you got to do is you got to get a little bitty three eighths hose clamp like you put on a fuel line, and tighten it up on there, and that squeezes them fingers in, and then you just jerk it out of there. Got me? That's the way you do that. All right. Now then, um, so that was number. Which one was that one? That was fifteen. That was fifteen. Which of the following steps is done first when replacing the transfer rear cables, which is the cables on that one there, and that's number sixteen. Um, disconnect the cable from the equalizer. The equalizer is that bar that both of the cables hook, you mean that the front cable hooks to, and then it pulls on both of the rear ones. That's the equalizer bar. Okay. Uh, which one of the following steps is done last when replacing the rear uh, transfer cables? And that is D, grease or oil is on the landings. <laughs> no, not really. Remove the cable from the backing plate. I went to the next question. Remove the cable from the backing plate. Now I'm basically on 17 right now. No, number 17. Yeah, that was just, you know, picking the only all. I jumped to number 18. Well, remove the cable from the backing plate. Which of the following does not usually cause the parking brakes to fail or hold? And that actually C. Corrosion has built up on the cable housing. That's not going to fail to cause them to hold. Now, if it's built up the right way, it may wind up causing them to stick where they won't release, you know. And finally, number 19, parking brake linkage consists of, you know, cables, connectors, guides. That's all of the above. And then number 20, uh, parking brake, hand lever, parking brake, hand lever assemblies are simple. What? 20 <coughs> is what? Hey. Uh, ratchets with a paw. Hey. There you go. That was real simple, real quick. We didn't need to be in here a long time for that. I'll do the and, and I'm going uh, to, huh? Uh, yeah, we'll actually uh, do that tomorrow.